Hello and welcome to the first session of our aerospace workshop from Simscale featuring Euroavia. I'm yes, I'm very happy to see so many people have joined the session today. And yes, this is as I mentioned the first out of three sessions, uh, and we will take uh, a ride through the world of simulation, how engineering simulation is used in aerospace industry to optimize performance and reliability of aircraft. First of all, uh, before uh, we start to dive in, I would like to make sure that everybody can hear me. Uh, so please, guys, there is a button in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel you have on your monitors where you can raise your hand. Please press this button in the case you can hear me loud and clearly. Great, I see already a lot of hands uh, uh, which are raised. Um, in the case, for some reasons, uh, audio connection should drop for you during this webinar, uh, you can also use our toll-free um, audio service numbers to dial in into the audio of the sessions. For this, you only have to dial one of these numbers. So if you're um, located in UK, for sure you should use uh, uh, this number for UK. Or if you're located in Austria, you should use a different number to, to make sure it's, it uh, stays toll-free. And then just enter this access code and you can join the session. Anyway, we will record the session and provide you later on with the recording. Yes, um, as I mentioned, today is our first session and we will take a look at ventilation of an aircraft cabin, but um, yes, before we start to, um, or before I start to introduce what we're going to do exactly today, I would just like also to welcome uh, my friend Avat from Euravia. He is the president of Euravia Toulouse, and yes, I'm just uh, waiting for his uh, words of welcome. Uh, hi guys, uh, welcome to all the participants and thank you Milad for giving Euravia this opportunity to partner with SimScale and you know learn more about the engineering simulations. We are really you know uh, delighted because all of the Euravia members can benefit from this workshop very well and uh, definitely we will look forward to having a session with you during the Symposium Euravia Toulouse plans to conduct in October and in fact maybe at the end of the workshop today uh, in two minutes I can give some details about the symposium. Yes, that sounds very great. So I would suggest let's just do the introduction and at the end of the session before the question and answer uh, I would say it's the best point for you to present uh, a symposium which will take place in October. Great, Avat, thank you very much. I would just now start to, to uh, introduce participants uh, to our today's agenda. Um, first of all, yes, we will talk a little bit about this webinar. So what is the idea of the webinar, what can be or what is your benefit and what will be the structure of the next sessions. Then uh, I will introduce you just in a very short way to the fundamentals of simulation. So what is engineering simulation, why do we need it and how can it help us? Then we will have uh, the live demonstration, so you will, uh, I will show you live how to set up a simulation with SimScale very easily. And then after that we will, uh, I will present homework assignment to you, which is for sure uh, not mandatory, but I would really, uh, I would be very happy to see a lot of homework submissions. And after that we have a lot of time uh, for your question and answers. Okay, then. Let's just do a crisp introduction to the idea of this webinar. Uh, first of all, maybe I would just like to introduce myself. My name is Milad. I'm working here at SimScale as an academic program manager. So um, my uh, main responsibility is to make sure that uh, our enhanced simulation platform can be used by all students around the world. Um, and therefore responsible also for corporations with institutions like Euravia. And uh, maybe about my education, I have a mechanical engineering background with uh, majors in also numerical engineering and also in um, uh, aerospace technology. The idea of this workshop is, first of all, 
to um, show you really the, the basics of engineering simulation and to provide you with hands-on experience with simulation. So the overall aim of this workshop is that everybody who attended all three sessions and submitted the homework is able to use our free SimScale platform in the future for his own project, for his own ideas. And um, yes, just we want to make people able who are interested in aerospace to use simulation technology as a tool. And therefore we cannot cover all topics. And we decided really to focus on everything which is important for um, users in the end, for engineers. So we will not talk too much about um, the theory of simulations, the mathematical background or something related to this. And we will also not talk too much about how simulation is used in other industries. In the case you are really interested in the fundamentals, and there are a lot of good books uh, which you should take a look at. And if you're interested, just send me a mail and I can send you all the recommendations. Um, and also what we are providing is a so-called professional training which costs regularly 500 euro. But everyone who submits all three homework assignments uh, will get access to this training for free and this is this training is uh, more general it's a three-day training uh, which is also about uh, fundamentals of simulation and how simulation can be used in, in independent from the industry Finally, a lot of people ask us every time we're preparing a workshop why you guys are doing this. And the answer is, is, is quite easy. First of all, we are, have all, a, a, let's say, a very strong academic background. So this company was founded out of university. The founders are very committed to the academic world. And therefore, we see it as a, a very a good opportunity for us to give something back to the academic world. On the other hand, for sure, we want to introduce our product to as many students as possible and use this as possible and nevertheless, which is maybe the most important uh, uh, thing for us, we are looking for a lot of feedback. So guys, please, if there is anything you like about SimSkill or you like not, let us know and we will uh, uh, try to collect all this feedback and, and optimize the product every day again and again. Um, maybe about the structure of this home uh, uh, workshop. This workshop is planned as a three event series. So we will have every week on Thursday 5 p.m. we will have a one hour online webinar session. And at the end of every session, and every session will be by the way about the dedicated topic, um, you will uh, get the opportunity to work on a homework assignment. This homework assignment uh, uh, will be uh, very hands-on and it will provide you also for sure with uh, uh, a dedicated step-by-step um, -step tutorial and also with dedicated support on our forum. And finally, you can just share this homework within one week using a form I will show you later. And if you submitted all three homeworks, you will get a certificate of uh, participation as well as uh, free access to our professional training. And um, there were a lot of questions in the last time. So let me just uh, talk about the most common questions and later on um, we can then, um, if you have more questions which are not answered, you can just put them into the forum. First of all, a lot of people asked me, I'm not able to, to join at that session or at another session. Will you record the sessions? Yes, and every workshop session, every webinar will be recorded and we will uh, upload it to our YouTube account as soon as possible. So this session, I think, will be available tomorrow in the morning. And a lot of people also ask if they should start to simulate during the session and the answer is definitely not. Really, the idea of this webinar sessions is to give you as much information as possible and therefore you should really uh, take the time to listen and ask your questions. In the case um, uh, you want to, to simulate, to do the homework, just wait after the session is over and then you still have one work. Also, a lot of people ask how they can simulate. This is quite easy. SimScale is a web-based simulation environment, a simulation platform. We'll talk about this later a little bit. So you just need a web browser, standard web browser, to, to access all our tools for free. And in the case you need support, please use our forum. 
forum.synscale.com, there is a dedicated section about this workshop where you can ask all your questions. And if you want to learn something about topics which are not covered here, as I mentioned, you can qualify for professional training and we also have a lot of other resources you can use uh, to, to learn more about simulation. Great, then now let's talk about the fundamentals of simulation. I'm not sure because uh, Ava told me that uh, a lot of people from Arabia have, let's say, not different backgrounds, but some of them are doing the bachelor degree, some of them are maybe in the end of the master degree, and maybe some of you also have already some previous experience simulation. Nevertheless, uh, let's do a crisp introduction to make sure everybody is on the same level of knowledge, and if you have a question, just write it into the question box, there is a, a, a box where you can uh, just type in your questions and I will answer them as soon as possible and latest at our Q&A session at the end. And first of all, let's talk about simulation. And the first question is maybe what is simulation and why simulation? Generally speaking, engineering simulation is a technology which allows you to do physical testing on a virtual environment on your computer. So instead of doing a physical experiment, you can just do a simulation based on a CAD model. This which can be very helpful in product uh, design or product development processes. Let's take a look at the general product design process and its timeline. And I mean, this is, let's say in the end, it's a generic process. Maybe it's in, in aerospace a little bit different, in automotive a little bit different, but in the end, this is the way product development worked for over 100 years in the past. And just imagine you're working as an engineer in an aerospace company and your job is to design a security wall for the hydraulics. And in an old process without engineering simulation, you first of all do your CAD design. This means you have to design the whole valve because you need a physical prototype to test it. So you're not only designing what is, I say, would say the main part of the valve, the valve body and, and, and how the fluid flow uh, section is looking like. You have to design really everything, every ceiling, every ball, even the electronics. And when this is done, and this takes a lot of time, you have to do a or to manufacture a physical prototype. You have to organize a test rig or something like that where you can test it. And after you did your physical testing, your experiments, then you have some insights, and you can redesign your model. And this is a very high costly, time consuming process because you have a lot of design cycles. Every time you change something, you have to remanufacture at least a part or the whole prototype. And so it takes a lot of time and is quite expensive. And the idea of using simulation, which is also called CAE for uh, computer aided engineering, is that Instead of designing the, uh, the full prototype first, you just start with a, with a rough idea. And in this case, you would just design maybe uh, the valve pipe and the valve body. Then you can do a virtual simulation without, without manufacturing your valve. You can, after, uh, based on the results of the simulation, you can implement very rapidly design change and therefore your whole design process is very uh, fast and cheap and you can run a lot of more design cycles and test cycles in a shorter time for less money. So the idea of designing with simulation is designing products better, faster and cheaper. And there are also a lot of other reasons why people use simulation. Just to give you an example for aerospace industry, uh, some, there are some things you cannot test physically, basically, before you have your final product. Just imagine aerodynamics of an of a aircraft. There is no wind tunnel in the world where you could put in the A380. So the only op uh, options you have is using a scale model or do simulation. And this is just one of, I would say, 100 reasons or examples why to use simulation and why simulation is used in so many industries. For example, aerospace industry basically was uh, beside um, uh, uh, maybe motorsports, one of the first industries using simulation. 
And you may ask yourself, oh, that sounds very good. So where's the problem? Why is not everybody using simulation? And the answer is quite easy. In the past, simulation was only available to a very small audience of companies and engineers. The reason is, or the reason was in the past, that traditional CAE tools come with a lot of barriers. So you have a financial barrier because, first of all, you need a software license and the, and the hardware. And for example, for, for uh, fluid flow simulations, CFD simulations, you cannot just use a high-performance workstation. For bigger simulations, you really need a high-performance computer, which is much expensive. And also the licenses can be very, very expensive. Like we're talking about several thousand euros a year minimum for a, buying a software license. Another reason is the so-called knowledge barrier. For, for most of for most students, this is maybe not very important anymore, but you should not forget, most of the simulation tools are really designed for experts. And when I'm talking about experts, I'm not referring to, to engineers, I'm really referring to experts of numerical simulation, numerical mathematics. And therefore, it was quite hard for smaller companies and young engineers to use this technology. SimScale is a so-called uh, cloud based simulation tool. And we are more than a tool, we are a simulation ecosystem. When using SimScale, you have all capabilities of a 3D simulation tool you know uh, uh, maybe from, from other companies. But you don't need to install any software to buy any licenses. You can access the software using your web browser. You just need a standard web browser internet connection and then you can run the software whenever you want and all computational capabilities and computational power is provided through the cloud, so the system is completely independent from a local computer. In addition to that, we are more than just a tool, we are an ecosystem. We are also providing the content, uh, which means we have a public um, library which contains thousands of, of uh, simulation projects which you can modify, reuse or use as a template for your own ideas. And SimScale is also the biggest community in the world for engineering simulation, but we'll talk about this uh, in, in a very short time. Just before we, uh, that's maybe the last thing I would like about SimScale before we talk about uh, what you guys are really interested in about aerospace technology. Uh, just to give you an overview what SimScale comes with. First of all, we have our forum. This forum um, allows you, let me just show you the forum, I think that's the best. You can just, if you go on our SimScale web page, you can here create a new user account to access our platform. And to reach the forum, you just go on Community Forum. And this forum is completely linked to our simulation platform. We have just to log in. And here you see a lot of categories where you can ask all your questions. And we have a lot of, of uh, SimScale employees which are active in this forum and will help you whenever you need, need uh, help, when you have a question, for example. And, uh, for example, we have um, uh, forums about how to use SimScale for different uh, simulation types. Uh, we have a forum section where you can give product feedback and we have a dedicated forum section for our workshops. And if there, for example, we have this uh, section for the aerospace workshop where you can already find right now the tutorial of the first homework I will present to you later. And if you have a question related, for example, to this homework, just go into this forum topic and reply to this and write your question and we will answer it as soon as possible. In addition to that, we also have the so-called uh, public uh, simulation library, you go on public projects and then here you can see hundreds of free uh, simulation projects including the geometry, all necessary uh, steps like the meshes and the results and you can just modify it, play around with it or even use it as a template for your own simulation. And um, what is also, I think, very unique about SimScale and which can be very helpful for you 
uh, is the SimScale, are the SimScale learning resources. So um, we have, for example, a very good documentation you can access on our website. We have a lot of learning videos, tutorials, interactive tutorials. We have a SimScale blog and even the professional training, which I talked about. Great. I think I talked enough about our product. Now let's sh let me show you how you can use this product uh, for your own simulation and ideas. And um, first of all, this is what we will do today. As I mentioned, we will talk about ventilation of our aircraft cabin. And I'm a big fan of explaining things by doing it. So we will just now set up a simulation for the ventilation and we'll ex uh, explain the basics of simulation to you step by step. First of all, this is our what we want to simulate. So here you can see the interior, the cabin of a passenger aircraft. It's a little bit simplified as you can see. So we have like seven seats in a in a uh, here. And as you know, uh, air comfort is a very important topic today. Uh, I mean, everybody who ever uh, uh, took a plane knows about um, the ventilation and, and air comfort within this plane and here, for example, you can see how this is actually working. We have several inlets, so this orange and green surfaces will be inlets in our further later simulation, and this red surfaces will be outlets. And in the end, how it's working is that um, you have uh, air here inside, and this air needs to be, first of all, needs to be cooled, and you need to add new oxygen because um, it's a closed system in the end, this aircraft cabin and the people are reducing the amount of oxygen in the air. So um, in the end, what is happening is that the old air is sucked out on the, where you can hear, where you can see this red surfaces. And then inside the aircraft, uh, there is a system which is responsible for uh, um, air conditioning of the air, but also for adding new oxygen. And it's working like uh, you're taking a part of the old air of the cabin, you're taking fresh air from the turbines, of the, from the jet turbines of uh, your aircraft, and then you are mixing it and bringing it back to the cabin. For sure, it's a little bit more complicated in, in, in reality, the technical system, but that's a basic uh, idea of how such systems are working. And in the end, the reason why we're simulating this, or why this is also simulated hundreds of times at Airbus and, and other aircraft manufacturers, is that, um, first of all, you want to maximize the comfort of the passengers. And you maybe know, you maybe know it that some people don't like to fly a plane because they're afraid of getting sick by the uh, air conditioner. And so one big aim of this simulation or this analysis in general is to make sure that the way the, the heat, if, if you want to heat up this, or the, the, the cold air is, is brought into the cabin, is that it should be very smooth and in a way nobody feels that actually there is uh, air conditioning. And another reason is that um, if you have a optimized system or optimized topology for your inlets and outlets, you can for sure also save energy, which is a very important point if you take a look at the uh, efficiency programs which uh, aircraft manufacturers are running right now. And what we will do today is we want to simulate this. And since we have two different inlets, we cannot only simulate how the system will behave, we can also simulate maybe different configurations like using only the mid inlets, using only the side uh, inlets, and so on. And before we start to set up the simulation, I think it's very important to get a rough idea about how simulation is working, because in the end, a little bit, it sounds a little bit like magic, but for sure, uh, it's a lot of science math and engineering know-how behind it. And first of all, let's take about the really general um, pro process of creating an engineering simulation, which is, by the way, independent from the application and in also independent from the simulation type. First of all, you need to do something which is called pre-processing. Pre-processing includes two steps. The first step is to prepare your CAD model 
for the simulation because in reality in industry you're using in the, the same cap model the manufacturer and manufacturing engineers are using later on to produce tools uh, and and uh, for manufacturing the aircraft and these cat models are sometimes not really suitable for a simulation which I will show you later on. Another very important part is the so-called meshing. So you're defining your simulation domain into a infinite into a finite number, not infinite, finite number of small elements. This mesh in the end is something like let's say the fundamental of your simulation and the quality of this mesh has a very big impact of the quality of simulation results. When this mesh was created, you can model your simulation. So you describe how your model is interacting with its environment and which physical laws you want to apply on this model. And the last step, which is maybe the nicest step, which makes a lot of fun, is to analyze the results and create visualizations. And First of all, let's talk a little bit about pre-processing before we start to create the simulation. And there are, let's say, three rules for pre-processing you should consider. The first rule is maybe a general rule for engineers and a very important rule for uh, simulation engineers. Make everything as simple as possible. So the best simulation, generally speaking, is as um, accurate as necessary and as simple as possible. Let you give me an example. And this is, by the way, all now, all this information are now mainly related to, to the CAD model and the model preparation. If you have a CAD model, for example, of an airplane, then you would take a look from near. Then you would see that your model includes, for example, a lot of, of bolts here. And this is very important. I mean, in the end, if you want to investigate, for example, uh, the structure of this, um, if this this part of the sheet metal, or if you want to manufacture it later on, for sure you need the information because you need to know where do I have, for example, holes in the metal. For investigating the aerodynamics, to be honest, it will not make a big difference because all the, the overall effect of all the small geometrical entities here is not very big if you take a look at the overall aerodynamic performance of the airplane but if you keep them in your model the simulation tool have to consider every of the small geometrical parts so the first step is in pre-processing reduce your model make it simple make it easy and in this case for example you would just remove everything what you think is not necessary for the simulation result. And there is another example. For example, here we see a propeller. And beside of really simplifying the model, so which is called the featuring also, uh, another very important part is to modify maybe the structure of your model. For example, here you can see uh, we did two things. First of all, or what I did is removing this inner hole because it will not later on uh, it will not affect the flow because there will be a bolt inside this hole and this small gap or small edge will have no not really a big influence on the flow field so I deleted it which is quite similar to the previous example with the aircraft what I also did is you can see it here I merged the surfaces because later on you will see that if we have a lot of small surfaces it will make the process of meshing very uncomfortable for us so this is very important it keeps this lesson really in your mind simplify the model as much as you can can the next thing is a little bit related to the uh, simplification of the cat model, cat model if we take a look at this cat model of a, of a uh, car it looks very nice on the first view but if we take a closer look we can see that here is a gap and for sure there is a gap because these are two independent parts and in reality you must be able to open uh, uh, open um, for example doors etc so you need this gap but again this gap will not have a very big influence on the overall performance but if there is if you don't remove this gap if you don't close it what will happen is that you will also consider the flow inside which is going inside this gap into the underhood bay and for some uh, let's say for some uh, special investigations maybe if we're interested in underhood um, 
uh, under thermal management, uh, you would be interested in that. And then you would maybe add an inlet here, open the model here. But basically, you want to do external aerodynamic simulation, and this will just make a job very complicated. And also, it will um, make the simulation tool to consider all the flow inside the car. So whenever this is a very important lesson is that you have to make sure your model is watertight. So there should be no gaps or holes inside the model. And the last thing you should consider every time you do a simulation, and which is also a very important part of pre-processing, which you have to do in your CAD system before you export your model to SimScale, is to make sure what actual kind of geometry you need. If we go back to our example of the valve, this is the CAD model of the valve. And independent from maybe small holes which is there or bolts which we don't need, if we want to do a fluid flow simulation, we're not interested in the valve body itself, we're interested in the um, domain inside this valve, the fluid flow domain. And then what we are doing is extracting this fluid flow domain. Most CAD tools provide dedicated um, tools for this. And then we will get out this inner domain. And if we want to do a fluid flow domain of this valve, we need this CAD model, this right one and not the left one. And yes, now let's talk a little bit about meshing and about the fundamentals of uh, CFD, of engineering simulation um, in general. And um, maybe let's start with a very s simple example. In the case, this is the first time you're working on engineering simulation. You might asking what simulation is and what meshing is, the process I described, which is also part of pre-processing, and what it has to do with simulation. And for this, we should really take a look at the general idea behind flow simulation. Um, when we realize that the general idea behind flow simulation is the origin of term meshing, and it's then the role of it will become clear. Let's take a look back to the past. Almost 200 years ago, several scientists discovered independently the so-called Navier-Stokes equation, which is uh, completely describing the motion of fluid substances. And this is a discussion, uh, 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 this uh, uh, equation, a uh, partial differential equation. And I mean, so far everything seems to be okay. Uh, and you would say you can just enter the equation to your computer and wait to the, for the result. Unfortunately, mathematical rules put a spoke into the wheel. In contrast to the physical equations you learned maybe at school, the Navier-Stokes equation is not solvable analytically. So you have the equation and you can, for example, put in values you measure and it will show you that it makes sense, but you cannot solve it. And this is exactly where engineering simulation comes from. And instead of solving these equations, let's assume this is the domain you want to simulate, a kind of pipe with a body in it. Um, and instead of solving this equation directly, which is not possible as I mentioned, flow simulation following the approach of solving the equation by approximation. So instead of solving the equation for an unlimited number of points within this flow domain, uh, we uh, will approximate the solution for a discrete number of points and divide our domain into small subdomains. And um, therefore, you have to define before starting the simulation in which points you want to calculate the solution. And as I mentioned, for this, you're dividing the geometry of the flow into the uh, small elements, which we're calling cells. And that's also the reason, as I mentioned, why it's called meshing. And in this example, you can see a lot of uh, uh, elements uh, which are the same size. but the size of these elements has a very important impact on your simulation result. Since you're only solving, in the end, the equation numerically in the center of these cells, um, there's the fact that the smaller the cells are, the most accurate your simulation result will be, which makes sense. Just imagine you have like a gradient 
here at the beginning and you have just two cells then you will only approximate this whole gradient with linear interpolation and so adapting the local mesh fineness allows you to optimize the mesh because uh, you need a different um, accuracy maybe in the near of, of this body than far away from it. And that's in the end the idea and strategy of meshing. So your job is defining by dividing this geometry uh, to defining where you want to uh, solve it, the equation and how accurate you want to solve it. And there are a lot of situations or regions where you should make your mesh finer. First of all, everywhere where your cross-section changes. So, for example, um, if you have a, a tube system or if you're simulating, for example, of the um, internal four, everywhere where you think the, the, the cross-section of your geometry is changing, you should refine it because you will have much more change of of physical values here. The same in the near of objects. Everywhere where you, for example, have an additional object which is interacting with the free stream, you should make your mesh finer because there you're expecting more changes. And also, what you should, um, why you should do mesh refinement is in the near of small features. I mean, we talked about the importance of defeaturing the model and make it easy, but sometimes you may be interested in, in the effect of a dedicated small feature, uh, and then you should make it more fine. And this is not only uh, related to um, the absolute size of, of the uh, small feature, but also to the relative size. And also around small features, you should make your mesh finer. So not only on the surface of them, but also in the region around. Okay, guys. Then we will take, before we start to create the mesh ourselves, we will take a look at something which is called boundary layer. I think most of you know what a boundary layer is since you are studying uh, aerospace or aircraft technology or engineering but just let's talk about it quickly for those people who never heard about it. As you know um, when we have a fluid flow flowing through or around something um, we are dividing the flow into two parts. We have one part which is far away from the wall of this object and we have a region in the near, which we call boundary layer. The reason why we are dividing this our flow into two parts is that uh, against what most people think, you can air has in, is interacting with with solid bodies. And in this case, uh, you can just imagine like that the uh, lowest layer of air. Just imagine air would be made a lot of thin layers. It's sticking to the surface of a solid body. So the velocity there is zero, the, the flow velocity. And outside, if you go far away right outside, which you can see here, you have the free stream conditions. And, the, and then you have a kind of gradient, a normal gradient in flow velocity. And this gradient also changes with the stream direction. So at the beginning, uh, you have uh, less friction, let's say friction of between uh, the air layers, and if you go downstream, this becomes more, and also your um, the, your boundary layer structure is changing. So what you can see here basically is uh, the air as a velocity versus the height. So the air on the surface has a velocity of zero, and then it becomes bigger and bigger. And if you would just do a, let's say, standard mesh refinement here, uh, you would get a big problem because your gradient of velocity is much higher in normal directions than in the direction of the flow. And therefore, we use a kind of special refinement which is called layer elements where we have a lot of flat cells which resolve uh, uh, the directional change of velocity in the near of the walls. And these layers are very important for realistic simulation. Without these layers, you will get absolutely wrong results for your um, boundary layer. And so you should use them um, uh, everywhere you expect a turbulent flow. And 
In the end, you should put them everywhere where possible. There is just one exception. Never put them on physical walls. Just imagine this face would be inlet. And then you will understand why you should not put them there. If this face would be inlet with a normal flow direction, then you wouldn't have this gradient and you would just waste elements. And this could also occur with so-called numerical problems. Because uh, in the end, we also sh should not forget, if you want to know the velocity at this point or here, you need the information of the cell behind it, in front of it, at the upper cell and lower cell. And if the distance between these points is not equivalent and it's, for example, very skewed, then you can also get bad results. Okay, then let's first of all, because we talked, I talked so much about the fundamentals, switch to our SimScale platform. And I've already logged in. And if I go, you go now to dashboard, you can see all my projects here. And I've just prepared something. So let's open this project. Okay, right, guys. As I mentioned, uh, we import this ge I imported this geometry, which includes um, uh, this project, which includes the geometry. And um, here you can see basically the CAD model. First of all, because I imported it as a STL, and STL the file format, which is merging all surfaces to one big surface, I used the split operation. To, to divide the model into different surfaces. And then we can just start to create a mesh. Therefore, click on the new mesh icon. This will open a new uh, window where you can select which geometry you want to mesh. In this case, we just have one geometry, so we will select aircraft cabin. Then click on save. And Right now, what we can do is um, adding a new mesh operation. And we have a lot of different mesh operations for different applications and dedicated for fluid flow simulation. We have hex dominant meshing and we have automatic uh, meshing tool for internal flow, automatic meshing tool for external flow and the automatic meshing tool, um, which is very general and parametric. So the first one, second one is semi-automatic, and this gives you full control of the mesh. We will use this parametric one. And to understand exactly what we are defining right now, let's take a look at the meshing process using this hex-dominant mesher. The idea of this hex-dominant mesher is that if you, if let's say we want to simulate the flow around this white car, we are um, around any object, we are creating a kind of background mesh or background domain which is bigger than the domain we are interested in to simulate. In this case, we want we have already prepared a negative of our wind tunnel, so we have a geometry including uh, volume where the air is and no volume where uh, the solid is. And first of all, you mesh this background mesh and when this background mesh is created, then you start to refine it locally. You can ref do, uh, uh, define re refinements based on edges, based on surfaces. So the difference is clear here. You just so it's like a cut. You're just uh, meshing here this edge. Here you're meshing the surface, and when this meshing of surface and edges is done, the inner cells, the wrong cells, are deleted. For this, you have to define a material point which shows which is in, what is inside and outside. After the cells are deleted, the volume refinements are applied, and then you are snapping the mesh because you want to avoid this rough, rough step structure. And the final step, you can add the layers we talked about. And this is what we want to do right now on the platform. So. First of all, what we have to do when we save this, we get here uh, operation tree added. And the first thing we have to define is the base mesh box. This is this mesh or this domain, pet domain around our geometry. And here I will just now create a domain which is a little bit bigger than our actual simulation domain. And you can define a box 
with the three or with two opposite points. Go on save and then you can see this box here. And next we have to define because if we go back now here to the first step we've created now like this background domain around this but now we need the background mesh and for this we have to define the initial mesh size uh, which we can do if we click on this operation and here you can define this how many cells you want in each direction so let's say in each direction we want 25 cells in y direction we want 55 cells and in that direction which is the largest direction we want 120 cells what you can also define at this point already is how many processors you want to use for using that simulation we will use 16 processors and the remaining options are fine so we will just save it and now we have our background mesh basically or the definition of our background mesh uh, next thing we have to do is to define the material point so to define which region you want to keep and which not and in our case I will just show you again this the surface here we want to keep everything inside so this point needs to be inside our geometry and this point for example I define with three coordinates is definitely inside so if we would now create it let's hide the base mesh box then you can see here the point which is inside and now we can start to create mesh refinements and we'll make it quite easy first of all we will apply a so-called surface refinement we will apply it on the whole geometry and we want a range between 2 and 3 which means that the level 0 is the initial mesh size we defined and every level you go higher means you're splitting the cells so this means you have nine times more cells than the initial mesh and this uh, and you can define a range and uh, our meshing tool will automatically choose the best mesh size based on several criteria and now go on save and this is done next we need the edge refinement to make sure that all edges, especially this edges, are captured fine. So let's call it edge. And we will use type is fine. And also this include angle, which describes for which angle a new edge should start. And now we just have to define the distance and uh, levels so a distance from two centimeters away from the edges we will have a mesh level of three and finally we will add the layers I already talked about and so I will use here layer addition this is fine and what I will do is now I have to select on which faces I want to apply this refinement and as I mentioned on all surfaces except the inlets and outlets so we will first of all select all and then we can remove the selection here for the mid inlets here for the side inlets and last but not least also for the outlets Add selection from viewer and if you now look back for this faces inlets outlets we have no we'll have no layers great 
In the end, now everything is done and we can start the meshing process. Go back on the meshing operation here and just press start, which will create the mesh. And now this mesh will be computed in the cloud on 16 CPUs in parallel. Right. Um, next. Let's switch to a project I've prepared and let's first of all do a quick wrap up. So just what I showed you. First of all I showed you how to open a project and then we learned how to create a hex dominant parametric mesh. We defined the bounding mesh box the size of the domain as well as the element size, added several refinements and the material point and finally the layers. There are some topics I did not talk about right now. First of all, the pre-processing, so preparing the model for the simulation in your CAD model and for sure there are a lot of more refinement strategies and types which you can use. And if you're interested in that, you can check out our documentation, some of our tutorials, or just take a look at our professional training for which you can qualify for free. And next, since we have our mesh, let's take a look at the mesh, how it's looking exactly, and then set up the actual simulation itself. Okay, here you can see it's the same project. I just already finished the mesh. No, it has to load. That sometimes take a little bit depending on your internet uh, connection and then the size of the model for sure. And yes, here you can see this mesh is already finished. And then you can see an overview of the number of elements, for example which is here uh, 4 million or 5 million, nearly 5 million cells, which is quite a lot. And then you can see here the mesh. So if we, for example, we can reset the view to zoom out. And then, for example, if we want to take a look inside, we just select surface, click on this hide selection button and then we can take a look inside and here you can for example see how the mesh was refined everywhere where we have edges or uh, a high uh, curve uh, proximity. And you can even take a look inside the mesh using clip filters etc which you will find here on the filter. Great, then let's now continue and set up the simulation itself. Therefore, I will switch to Simulation Designer, click on Add New Simulation, and then I will choose Incompressible in our case. Um, we have uh, this will be a turbulent flow, so we need a turbulent, mod, turbulent model to uh, solve the turbulence and we are only interested in the final result in the average flow field, so we will do a steady state simulation. Then we get automatically the right solver assigned, click on save, and then the tree will be prepared and guide you through all simulation steps. First of all, my friends, we need to choose the mesh. In this case it's quite easy because we have only one mesh, so select it, click on save, and then this mesh will be connected to your simulation. Um, oh, there are already uh, some 
questions. And the first question is by Arpit. And he wants to know how do you decide the number of cells in particular directions? You choose 25 in next direction. Arpit, that's a very good question. Before we continue, I would like to answer this question. Um, in the end, what the process is, you should first of all make a thought about what local cell size you want at the end. And, and what I did in this case is, in the end, it makes not really a big difference because you can just start with a cell level you ever you want. But the way we are this, or I would decide it is, I would just take a rough look at my uh, look at the dimensions of my model. And um, here, for example. And in the end. The reason why I choose 25, 55, 55, and 120 was that that allowed me to define uh, the model in elements which have the same, nearly the same length in all directions. And based on this, this was the most important criteria for me, because if you have very skewed elements or like that something look like a brick element, that can create numerical problems. And based on that, I just decided which local cell size do I want to have? And then you can calculate very easily, like level three. If you have a base mesh size of, uh, for example, here it would be defined by 25, like four centimeter. And if you have a four centimeter base mesh size, level one is two centimeter, level three is, uh, level uh, one is two centimeter, level two is one centimeter, level three is a half centimeter. And that's the way you decide the number of cells in each particular direction. And just remember, this is only for your base mesh. Did this answer your question? If not, uh, I can answer it. Try to answer it again. And there is a second question by Mohammed, and he didn't understand why the outlets and inlet are without boundary layers. And for this, let's just me do a quick sketch, and then I think you will understand it. Okay. Let's say this is our pipe we talked about before. Then, for sure, we will have a boundary layer. And the boundary layer will be exactly Let's mark it in red. We will have here a boundary layer and here on these two surfaces. If you now took a look at the inlet, let's say this is the inlet. If you would do here layer elements, like for example, like let's do it in green the mesh, like this. Sorry, wait one second. It would make no sense because the reason why you're using these flat elements which are growing is that you want to capture the gradient of flow direction. But at the inlet, your flow profile is not looking... Um, your fl flow profile is not looking like this. It's not a parabolic profile. At the inlet, your fl flow profile is just... Uh, like this, because it's an inlet, and at the inlet, you have a, a constant uh, f flow rate, a flow rate or constant velocity, and for this flow profile, like this, it makes no difference if you have flat elements, or not, not flat elements, because you have no change in this direction. And the only reason you are using these flat elements is to resolve the gradient which you have here, which is not existing at the inlet, and therefore it makes no sense. And in uh, practice, uh, in, 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 uh, if you use simulation uh, in, in industry later on, you will see that the flat elements on 
inlets can also create problems because they are like resolving the complete wrong um, uh, the complete wrong um, gradient because the only gradient you may have at the inlet is uh, here in the near like a very small profile and therefore you don't use them. Did this answer the question Mohamed? Uh, next question is by Giorgio and he wants to know if I can show you how boundary layer mesh is closed near the inlet outlet. Uh, there are no layers so I wonder if it keeps all layers we are adding or the software is collapsing them like snappy X mesh or open form. Good question. By the way, uh, uh, Giorgio, uh, our parametric hex mesh is based on snappy X mesh. So therefore um, it will collapse also based on the angle you can define but if you would uh, add on the inlet surface, add it uh, at really layers, he would try to create them. Oh sorry Greg <laughs> for spelling out your uh, name wrong, sorry. And um, so I hope this answers your question. Um, next question is when you do mesh refinement with different options, let's say you apply edge refinement and the layer refinement together, does the cells belong at the edges get double refined? No. That's a uh, also a very good question. Um, you just have to imagine like in the background the tool is is also checking which different um, uh, refinements you use and it will only like solving the most fine refinement. So if you for example uh, let's say make again <laughs> make a sketch. If this is your object and you apply like a volume refinement here, this green area, and let's say your refinement level here would be, or your cell size you define would be like one centimeter, or make it easier, level three. And if you add a surface refinement on this surface with level four, then he will ma make the mesh on the surface here finer and the mesh around it uh, coarser, so this will be level three, this will be level four, and then he will like have a kind of area where the mesh size is like growing from, uh, is, is growing from three to four and the mesh becomes finer. If you, let's say, would put inside this uh, additional refinement box with level 2, it will be ignored. And if this box is looking like this, then what will happen is that he will only ignore this part. Um, if uh, you have, uh, if this doesn't answer your question in general, just write a message to the, the question box. Um, and guys, if the question is not really related uh, to a step we're doing right now, please wait because in the end we have also time for question and answers. Um, yes, then um, there is a. Just let me. Do, sort your questions a little bit because you're writing so many questions. Um, so if we will... Um, that's a good question by by uh, Jan Lee. Uh, how much time will it take to generate this formally mesh using SimScale? And for this you can just go back on the mesh creator, go to the mesh project and then uh, you can see uh, when the run, for example, was finished. It was finished uh, at 5.23. And uh, one option to check is what's the time 
which is needed is to go to the log and then you can see here 680 seconds so nearly yes two minutes okay then let's go back to our simulation project just write your question in the box and I will answer them as, as soon as it makes makes sense um, a question uh, is related to which is the difference between uh, uh, Kiyomi gases T and other methods to solve turbulent flow um, this question is very detailed and it seems like you have really a lot of knowledge about fluid flow simulation to give you a very short answer the difference for example between Kiyomi gases T and K epsilon and K standard omega, K omega is that K omega gases T is a hybrid turbulent model that means it used in the near of walls another approach for solving the flows in far away. Um, and okay, then let's just continue with the demo and then we can answer the, the remaining questions. Uh, no. First of all, after we imported our mesh, we will define so called topological entities. So I will delete the existing one and show you how to create them. Um, topological entities are a help you can use to um, group surfaces of volumes or edges to, to subgroups if you want to select them later on. And first of all, let's change representation type to surface so it's easier to see different edges and faces. And what I will do right now is create for different group for the side inlets, for the inner inlets, for the outlet, and for the rest. So let's start with the mid inlet, call this just mid inlet and now we have a surface group which contains these two surfaces. We can do the same for the side inlets here and here on the other side. And we will do the same for the outlet. Now we have a lot of walls remaining and the good thing is all walls which are not an inlet, an outlet or a symmetric plane will be treated as standard walls. So let's just create a second set for the symmetry. We put our two uh, symmetrical uh, planes and what we do right now is selecting all the stuff we selected before. Again, as well as the outlets, and then we can just invert the selection and create a last entity group for all remaining walls. Yes, and after this is done, we can resume with the next steps. Um, there is a question by Fabio and he just wants to know if a cyclic boundary condition wouldn't be better instead of symmetry. Um, yes, I mean that's a good question and let me um, answer it this way. Uh, there are a lot of different definitions for symmetry boundary conditions like uh, in other tools they are different and um, in our case we have also cyclic boundary condition but uh, we just say because we don't want to say it's cyclic we just want to say that there is uh, no gradient on the uh, both sides so like it's a balance and therefore I just call it symmetry in the end what we will do later on is like a cyclic boundary condition and uh, but we will not map this side on the other we will just assume that there is no gradient 
Um, but this is a very good question, Fabio. And um, yes, you're right. It would be maybe a better solution, but make it also a little bit more complex. And since this should be quite hands-on in the first introduction to SimScale, we decided to make it this way. Okay, next we have to just add the material. So we have to define which physical properties or which material model we want to use for this fluid flow domain. And uh, we have um, different opportunities to add a material and we have also, so we can define it manually by defining the kinematic viscosity, but we have also a material library. We can just choose air, click on save, then add it and now the whole domain will treat it as air. And um, yes, next steps you can see are so initial conditions and boundary conditions. And um, as you know, we are solving the equations, the Navier-Stokes equation, approximately using the mesh. And for such numerical approaches, we need a start value because in the end, what SimScale is doing, the solver, he is like it's an iterative approach. He is calculate. He takes the initial solution, which we define with our initial condition, calculating then based on the equations the error. So the error between uh, uh, what the result is and what the result should look like. And then based on this error, we are modifying, uh, let's say, uh, the parameters, not the boundary conditions, but the values in the cell. And then we take uh, the previous result to calculate the next result. Um, and the problem is you need a point to start with. and this point is defined by initial conditions. This solution does not need to be in the near of the final result. In our case, we will just keep the pressure zero. And this, and this is very important. Zero means that there is no difference, pressure difference. So it's not absolute pressure, it's relative pressure. We will also say that there is no flow field. All these things we will define are k and omega. K and omega um, are uh, values or parameters which are used in the so-called K omega turbulence model to describe uh, the turbulence. And uh, K is a uh, turbulent kinetic energy. And omega in the end is the turbulent dissipation rate, which is like a frequency. And the value for K is fine. The value for omega should be modified because it's too high. And you may ask yourself, how can I calculate this value? Um, there are different approaches. So there are some very quite easy, easy formulas you can use uh, if you're interested in. Um, we can provide you with such a, a calculation sheet. But you will also find in the forum, for example, some uh, article where someone really described quite uh, detailed how to calculate them. And for a first assumption of uh, uh, K and omega, in the end, you just need to know uh, material properties like viscosity, uh, the, the characteristic, char characteristic length of the body, and then you can calculate it. And just don't forget, what we're defining here is like the pressure in the whole cabin as uh, environment pressure at the first iteration. There is the uh, air is not moving. And K and omega, the turbulence values, are uh, uniformly um, with these values in the whole field. And later on, for sure, we will have different values for each cell. Next thing is much more important, is so-called boundary conditions. And in contrast to uh, the initial conditions, which are just the value for the first step and which will be lost for, and after the first iteration, the boundary condition will stay constant the whole simulation because they are describing their interaction between your model and its environment. Let's just define them and then it will become clear. First of all, we need to inlet. And in this case, we will just use the mid inlets as a velocity inlet with the volumetric flow rate of 0 0.02835 um, 
Yes, and for sure you can also add a mass flow rate and then you have to specify the density, makes no difference in the end. And now, if I go on select assignment, these two faces, which are, and now we can here select the topological face sets, will be inlets with the inlet flow rate of 0 0.02835. And if you care about the direction, don't worry, he is automatically detecting the surface normal, so this flow rate is only in surface normal. You could also specify the same with using a, a, a fixed value for each component. And right now, so the only inlets are here. And next we will add the outlet. So the type is pressure outlet. Select outlet, save our selection. And here you can, for example, define a, a gauge pressure. But uh, we want to have environment pressure at the outlet. And if you now go on select assignment, you can see the SASOS are used as a pressure outlet. So flow will get into the system here and leave the system there. Let's rename it to outlet quickly. And next thing we will define is uh, symmetries. So, type. Uh, and if you want, for example, a cyclic, you can use this periodic boundary condition, but we will use symmetry. Just select it here. And save it. Next thing we have to add, let's call it walls. So in this boundary condition, we will add to all surfaces, which should just be standard physical walls. As a type, we will use um, wall with no slip. So it's a wall which is interacting with the flow. And we will select sim, eh, not sim, walls as well as side inlet, because we need to define a boundary condition for every surface. And we want this inlet to be closed, the side inlets. Well. And now we're nearly done. Um, we now will modify a little bit the numerics. Numeric settings, numerical settings are the settings of uh, uh, the simulation code, which uh, is later on using, uh, uh, which later on used to calculate the numerical solution. And we can choose between different, for example, solvers, linear solvers. Uh, I will use GAMG for pressure and smooth solvers for all other quantities. And for calculating um, divergence schemes, we will use so-called bounded Gauss upwind schemes. But this is, in the end, this is a lot of experience. And for example, the settings I'm showing you, you can use them like for, let's say, 90-90% of external fluid flow simulation. So just save it. And if you're really interested in this, you should really check out the documentation or take part of professional training where we'll talk more about the settings. But in the end, you don't need to understand how they're working 100%. You just need to understand when which one makes sense. For example, bounded Gauss, Gauss upwind mean he's using a, a, a upwind, a higher order Gauss uh, scheme for uh, 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 calculating divergence in the in the points and up uh, and bounded is a, a approach which is uh, more stable and faster but which take more computational resources and in the end these values are not describing uh, your model but how you want to solve your model mathematically finally we're defining simulation control um, this is, as I mentioned, uh, we're using iterative approach for solving the simulation. So we have to define how many simulation steps we want to do. In our case, 1,500 with the length of one. So in the end, you're calculating the set out of this. If this would be 0 0.1, you would have like uh, not 1,500, but 15,000 iterations. Now we can choose a number of, of cores, we want 16, CP, six, uh, 16 CPUs. And you can also define the maximum runtime uh, until your job is killed automatically. And uh, yes, we just keep it very high. 
to avoid that the job get stopped automatically. And now we are nearly done. We can just uh, check our simulation. And then, for example, here we get a warning. And the warning makes sense because this default writing interval is 50. And if we would keep this, this uh, uh, settings, it would mean that we are calculating like um, so we are writing 30 mean results, but since we are only interested in the final result and the most accurate result, we will change this and then we will only save the final result. And if we run the check again, everything is fine, and then we can create a snapshot of our simulation settings and start the simulation pressing the Start Simulation button. Okay, then um, I will just start the simulation. And let's do a quick wrap up. And then uh, we can take a look at the results I prepared. So, simulation setup. Uh, what did I show you? First of all, we talked about general setup, so how to create a new uh, analyzers and uh, how to specify, for example, if you're more interested in a steady state or a, a, a non steady state result and how to just to specify in the end the general simulation settings. In our case, we did a steady state simulation with a K omega turbulence model. Next step I showed you is to sign a mesh, which is quite easy, and also how to, to take a look at the um, uh, properties of the mesh. Then we created topological entity sets to, to make our later work easier. But sure, you can also skip this step and select the boundary condition based on faces instead of face sets. We did the material definition, defined initial boundary condition, and started the simulation. There are a lot of advanced topics uh, where we cannot talk about today. First of all, turbulence modeling, where already uh, uh, some people ask questions. Um, if you're very, very interested in this, um, just keep up with us in the third session, which will be about external aerodynamics of an aircraft. We will talk a little bit more about this. Um, and for sure, advanced topics are numerical solver settings, which effects they have, and also so called advanced solver control. Uh, so you can also define actions for the solver, like every time you are, you are calculating new iteration, uh, like calculate the average pressure or something like that. Okay. Then um, let's switch back. For sure, I've again prepared something. And now we will close this and switch to the project which I've prepared, including all results. And oh. Okay, then we have some questions. I will just answer in a few seconds. Let's first of all take a look at the results. Yes, um, when the simulation is finished, and this is, I think was also one of the first questions um, asked um, by Christopher. Um, and so when the simulation was finished, you will get a notification by email, and also uh, this will become green. And then you can see the runtime. So this was 150 minutes, which is a little bit more than two hours, which is not bad. Uh, in the end, we could also use more than 16 processors to accelerate uh, the time the simulation uh, uh, is finished. And a general rule maybe is like you should have at least 200,000 cells per processor. So in our case, we could even use 32, um, nearly 32 cores. And you can see the result size. Uh, first of all, during the calculation, you will see this chart which get updated automatically. And it shows you the so-called uh, residuals. And the residuals in the end like uh, the two, uh, simulation tool is calculating the average error for each of those quantities. So the first three things, the velocities in the end, um, they are for our mass conversion, which is one of the basic rules of the Navier-Stokes equation. It says that mass is, 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 it cannot get lost. Uh, pressure is used for our energy con. Uh, uh, in, so energy can also not be destroyed or created new. So and k and omega is for the turbulence model. And you can see 
you have no error or you have the f the, uh, the first error is um, uh, calculated for the first step is nearly one for for the velocities and for omega it's much smaller and with every iteration your um, error gets smaller and in the end the average error for pressure is like uh, 0 0.2 percent for k 0. 0.05% and so on and so on. So and in the end what you want or what you can see of the simulation is, is good is that first of all all these graphs should go down, all these lines and they should be much quite constant in the end. So this is quite good. What you should not forget this is only showing you how your uh, mathematical or how your numerical approach is converging. If you have a wrong model, it can only also converge, but you still have a wrong result. Uh, so this is, uh, but this is a quite good indicator. And um, yes, then we have some other things we can check out. For example, is the solver lock. And uh, here again, we're using open form solver, which is modified by us, and so you can see all the information like. Uh, residuals, etc. And now let's switch to the post processor. And here you can then open the solution field, so your 3D simulation results. And then we can now take a look into the results and do live online post processing. For sure you can also download the results and do it with your local post processor. So with a local software, or you can download a local version of Paraview, which is a, a 3D visualization software, which is also uh, uh, in the end used for, for our 3D visualization. And um, but we have some questions I would like to to uh, answer first. And um, first of all, let me just look for the right order. Uh, the first question is uh, if we have uh, also Maxwell slip condition for raw field flows. Um, right now we have not implemented a so-called Maxwell slip condition, but uh, you are able to define so-called um, custom boundary condition, which gives you a lot of power. Um, I will show you. Here, for example, if you go on this boundary condition, you can change it to custom. And then you can choose from a lot of options for every quantity like. And just to give you an example, velocity inlet in the end would be the same like velocity uh, pressure um set gradient to zero and fixed value for k and omega and with this custom boundary conditions which are very powerful you can really create your own kind of boundary conditions and to be honest i'm not exactly know for what you're using maxwell slip condition i think for supersonic flow right and there you could just combine your own boundary condition. Uh, next question was by Christopher and he just wants to know uh, if the solution would still converge or so the simulation would still work if I have not changed the numerical settings and yes it would work but it would take longer and the results would not be as good as they are after 1500 iteration. Uh, William, I think I showed you how to see the convergence, right? I hope your question is answered. Then the next question is by um, um, uh, what the tolerance value set for convergence and sim scale of this could be modified. Yes, it can. If you go on uh, simulation control, sorry now, numerics, you can see here residual control 
and here you can define for which absolute tolerance he should automatically stop and save, stop the calculation process and self, save the results. Now let's just assume with our post-processing and then we can answer the remaining questions. So in the meantime, the result was loaded to our 3D post-processor. As you can see, I can interact with my model in 3D. And first of all, let's ex I would like to explain you the structure. So here you can select what you want to visualize and here inside this window is our 3D post-processor. By default, we are loading the time step zero, so our initial conditions, and pressure for the whole simulation. Here you can control, this is our simulation in the end, what you want to import. So right now we are only importing the internal mesh but not the surface meshes. And you can select which cell areas you want to import. And the, the idea right now is here you can control which time step you want to investigate. And since we are investigate, interested in the final result, let's just jump to the latest time step. Right now the pressure is, as you see, zero, it's blue. If you take the legend blue is zero, uh, which makes sense because uh, our initial condition was pressure is zero in the whole domain. If we now uh, jump to the last time, uh, uh, time step, you will see how this value have changed during the computation. And if you now rescale your values, you can see the pressure distribution at the surrounding walls of the aircraft cabinet. Um, we could also take a look, for example, at the velocity, but it would not be give a lot of insights because velocity at the walls is zero because it's sticking and at the inlet and outlet it it's outlet, uh, at the inlet, it's an inlet flow velocity, uh, so the volumetric flow divided by the area, and at the outlet, it's maybe the only phase where we don't know. Um, for sure, sorry, since we have not added the outer walls, uh, you can see still a velocity um, uh, here on the symmetry. And that's the reason why it's not zero, because the symmetry is actually not treated like a wall. But the uh, remaining walls are all blue. Let's open the legend. And blue means velocity of zero. And what is also interesting, what you can see here, that there is a little bit different um, flow uh, velocity distribution on the two outlets, but just can also the reason can be numerical instability. So if this is like a difference of 0.001 meter per second, it's maybe just a numerical thing and not a physical difference. Next, I mean this is quite interesting, but it's not really helping. What we want to do is take a look inside the flow, and therefore we will add a filter. And now in the end, we are applying a filter a so-called slice filter on the whole model, that means we're creating a slice through this volume. And uh, the slice is defined by a plane, and so plane can be defined by your origin point and the normal very easily. And let's do a plane in x direction, which is quite easy, because for this we just need to modify the origin in x, and we can keep the normal. Um, and first of all, this point is fine. Remove the show plane option. And then the plane is calculated and updated, which can take a little bit with a slower internet connection. And you should not forget at least that we have uh, like 4 million cells here. Um, the good thing is since it's cloud-based, even for like 20 or 30 million cells, it will not become slower. Now we can see the pressure distribution again, but we are not interested in the pressure. If you think back on what I told you at the beginning of this presentation, uh, the main point of interest is the comfort here. So let's take a look at the velocity distribution in this plane, because this plane is like exact in front of the face 
of our dummies. And if we now update the velocity distribution, let's show you just a second, good trick, because we have the plane now, but maybe you want to need the orientation where this plane is exactly, just change this representation to a solid color, which will not have an effect because it's uh, it was hided automatically when you created the slice. And then we can change the opacity of our fluid flow domain and can take a look inside and also see the plane. So here, just change opacity to 0 0.2. For example, 1 means no opacity, or 1 means it's a solid, and 0 will be it's completely transparent. Just wait like some seconds. And then we can really take a look inside our cabinet to understand how the flow, and for sure, we have to show it also. Yes, and now you can see we are just in front of the face of the passengers here. And that activates the color legend. So we can see right now, like we have here. So, and it's like uh, what we expected. The flow is leaving from these inlets. Oh, uh, it's not leaving. It's it's entering the flow domain uh, from these inlets and leaving here. And here you can see a little bit the flow field. So it seems like we have a circulation here. And to visualize the circulation better, I will add a filter on top of the slice, which is called glyph. And this one will create glyphs, uh, uh, vectors, which show us exactly how the flow, in which direction the flow is streaming. So first of all, uh, we don't want to have a scalar because pressure distribution we're not interested in. We want to uh, have velocity vectors, so we will wait just for some seconds until everything is loaded, and then we will change scalar to none, vectors to velocity, and use the scale factor of 0 0.15. So we have a no scaling, so we have absolute length for all vectors, independent from their um, uh, the magnitude. And now, in the cloud, we are calculating all these vectors. And since they, when they're calculated, they will be just updated and uh, pushed to your view. And um, now, we just see the, change the representation to a solid color. And now, I mean, you can really see what is happening. We have these two flows here. And this flow is like creating a big vertex here. And so we have a lot of, of, of air recirculation here and here, which is good, because it makes sure that uh, if we later on would also simulate heat transfer, that like cool air, if in the case you want to cool down the cabinet, is, is distributed to all the two people here, and same on the other side. If we turn off the glyphs, we can see that the magnitude here is quite low. I mean, it's it's between dark blue, a little bit lighter blue, so we're talking about the magnitude of 10 centimeters per second. It's still not perfect, but it's also not like very, very uh, fast. And what we can also do is if we go back on our plane, right now we are taking only a look at the magnitude, but we can also take a look like at the uh, the component in that direction. And um, since this is a so-called cold simulation, so we are not um, considering um, or taking in account the uh, uh, convection. Uh, and we can now, for example, see if the the, the initial baseline is good or bad. For example, here you see you have like in this direction that is that direction 
you have like uh, in this area no no velocity if you take a look at x direction which is the normal of this plane uh, of this uh, visualization plane then you would see what uh, 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 how the distribution is there and then you can understand step by step how the flow is reacting in this region and since this is also very very uh, it's not very big and let's change it to that and then you can see what I mean we expected that in the end what people will feel is like um, uh, uh, here in this area they will, be, they will not really feel a lot of air recirculation because in every of the three components a little part of the magnitude is in every of these components here in this area and so it looks like a very good concept and what you could do right now for example is uh, testing two different setups and then just compare and then you would get a rough idea which one is working better I mean beside of planes and vectors we can also do streamlines for this we will add a new filter and important here is to add this filter on the whole run and not on the slice or not on the glyph so we will add the stream tracer filter which will create streamlines and if we change now it to uh, the representation to velocity then this um, streamlines will be colored by the magnitude of velocity and you can also by the way save screenshots so the whole changes to velocity you can scrape screenshots with viewport tools with this button and for example right now the seed source is a point which is coordinates here uh, where the streamlines come from and what we can do for example is to change this to a high resolution line source and put a line like here um, Mm, for example, like this. And then we would have a different seed source and yes based with this three very easy tools you can really get a very first insight to the fluid flow and here you can really see like that for this guy here in the middle the comfort will not be very good because it's really like a blast on the other hand it's a lowest flow velocity and based on this you can try to optimize uh, this, uh, the design of the cabinet or the uh, climatization of the cabinet very easily step by step and here just by for example activating this faces at the inlet you could have like three or four different versions based on one model okay finally we will create a screenshot for example which will be added then here and you can also even save this whole post-processing state um, by um, let's click on the save state button okay let's do a last wrap up so I showed you how to change time step and uh, load your simulation our 3d browser-based post processor and how to create different post processing object objects like slices streamlines and vector for sure there are a lot of different other objects you can create like contours iso contours plots etc in the end only your fantasy is, is limiting your possibilities there and um, what you can also do 
is derivate additional physical quantities based on your own ideas. So, for example, introduce a new quantity. Uh, do that just say, for example, pressure divided by velocity. I mean, it would physically maybe make no sense, but another good example is later on you could like divide, um, uh, for example, uh, if you do external fluid flow simulation, you can use this to calculate CP yourself. This can be done also on the platform. And you can also do local process, post-processing, exporting um, the simulation and download it. Great, then let's just show me your home, uh, let me show you your homework. So your homework assignment for this week will be to create such a simulation yourself. The geometry is quite similar, a little bit different. So now we have only two, um, two seed groups and not three. Uh, don't worry, you will get first of all um, a lot of resources like a step-by-step -step instruction and you will use automatic meshing instead of manual meshing. And in the end what you should do is you have three different inlet sets, two different outlet sets and you should create a fluid flow simulation for all six combinations which is sounds sounds very lot of, like a lot of work at the beginning but in the end it's quite easy you just create one mesh create all the topological sets and then you can just create different uh, combinations and run the simulation. Um, Yes, on our website, here, let's just open it, you will find on simscale.com slash uh, aerospace workshop, you will find everything you need. So this is the page you also use for registration and here you can see now the tutorial of, of uh, the first homework including a link where you can import the project which contains your geometry, the step-by-step -step instructions and also here you can find a link to a form to submit your homework later on. So you will just provide us with your um, homework link. And if you have questions, uh, you can just use uh, or problems, just answer to the post in the forum. And if you don't have a SimScale account right now, you can create a free account using SimScale. is completely for free uh, as long as you are part of the community. That means uh, you can use SimScale for free, but in, in, uh, uh, your projects will be available to other users as the inspiration. Um, yes, you have one week to do this uh, homework and um, you will get all the help you need. And I'm really looking forward to your ideas. So guys, if you have an idea for, let's say, another configuration or if you want to do some, some more post-processing, please share your ideas, your insights with us and let's discuss about this simulation in the forum. Um, yes then I would say now it's time for your questions. You already wrote a lot of questions, but before we start with the questions, uh, I would like to give uh, uh, the word to Avat again that, so that he can just say to tell you uh, a few words about the symposium which will take place um, in October. Avat, can you hear me? Oh yes, Milad, very well and clear. First of all, thank you for such an amazing webinar today. It was, it was really interesting, I'm sure, you, for all of the all of the participants. If you and, have a slide, uh, yes. So it is. If you have a slide, we can just it make is, it, it the is. presenter. Then you can show a slide, or is it necessary? Uh, yeah, I have a slide. If uh, I can share it, then let you just make you to the presenter. Then you can uh, use the slide. One second. Um, Now you should be able to share your screen. Yes, so I hope you can see the presentations, see the slides. Yes. Okay, so uh, first of all, just a short introduction to Euravia Toulouse. Uh, we are the European Association of Aerospace Students based in Toulouse. We are the Toulouse branch of it. And very quickly I'll go through the introduction because I see that already we have been here for quite long. 
although an interesting workshop. So we regularly conduct workshops and webinars on the themes of aerospace to spread awareness about aerospace and to develop skills amongst aerospace students. Uh, examples of such trainings are what we are doing right now with SimScale. It is, it is really one of the biggest collaborations we have had in terms of educational training. Uh, so going on the, on the same track, uh, we are conducting a symposium in October uh, for which uh, SimScale is a very big partner for us. Uh, they will also be participating in the symposium and uh, conducting similar workshops uh, during the, uh, the symposium. Uh, the highlight of that event is uh, SimScale will conduct a competition, a contest, where again there will be some similar kind of simulation tasks and there are prizes for that. So I would really like to encourage all the participants, all the Euravia members to come to Toulouse, participate in the symposium. You know, not, not every day do you get chances to see a new city to explore the aerospace field, to explore the aerospace hub of Europe, alongside learning some important skills used in the aeronautical industry. It is these skills which Milad was just talking about, which you are actually going to use whether you join Airbus or Boeing or ATR or any of the aerospace companies. So talking about the symposium, uh, it will take place from 12th to 15th of October 2016 and today we officially launch the website for the symposium. The details of the schedule are present on the website so I'll just share it with you. You can go to our page uraviatoulouse.org and there you will find this notification about registering, the, registering for the symposium. You click on register here and you can find all of the details of the events. So here if you see on 12th of October we have the entire day dedicated to SimScale. Uh, maybe Milad will join us and he will talk more about such engineering simulations. We take you to the City of Space Museum the next day, certain talks on 14th and then we also take you to the A380 final assembly line. So officially we are opening the registrations. I request all of you to register for it as soon as possible and join Euravia with the most excitement. Uh, I would also like to thanks, uh, thank Ura, uh, thank uh, Sir, uh, Milad once again and uh, also I request all of you to attend the future webinars which SimScale and Euravia will host uh, every Thursday for the next two weeks. I'm sure they are going to be equally interesting and then in September once again we have another series of webinars uh, hosted along with the uh, SimScale where we will also be inviting engineers from Airbus and Unera to you know throw insights on how these techniques are actually used in the industry. So I'm sure they will help you uh, in, in recognizing what all skills you need to learn before you get into the industry. And not just that, uh, these webinars uh, they will serve as some preliminary training for the contest which SimScale will conduct during the symposium. So if you're attending these webinars, you will be ready for the contest beforehand and you might have an edge over others who might, you know, just see the SimScale platform for the first time. So it's, it's beneficial for you, it's totally free, you get certificates, you get training certificates, you get prizes worth 500 euros, it's a win-win situation. So yeah, I think that would be all from my side and we can, we can continue with the questions. Thank you very much. Um, yes, and again also s thank you from the SimScale team for joining the session. We have still some questions I would like to answer. So, um, a question by William. He wants to know if the distance between the object and the frame involves side effects like wall effects like a wind tunnel. And basically it depends on what you are measuring. If you have a external fluid flow simulation, for example, for sure it, the size of your bounding box will be the size of your wind tunnel in the end, so it will have the effect. In our case, uh, we are doing internal flow simulation, so in the end we are just using the same as uh, bounding surfaces like the CAT model and it will have no effect. But if you make it this box smaller than your object, you will uh, lose a part of the domain and if you make it too big, I mean really too big, like 10, 20 times bigger, it can create problems uh, with, with the optimization of the mesh. And next question is by um, Christopher. 
And uh, sorry, it's by uh, no, it's by Christopher. And he wants to know how effective SimScale is against other commercial available softwares like Sluent and Star CCM. That's a very good question. And uh, maybe first of all, um, our CFD technology is is mainly based on OpenFoam and some other uh, uh, codes uh, where you can uh, choose which you to use. And but most of our customers and users are using OpenFoam for external. Of fluid, uh, external dynamics and fluid flow simulation, and generally speaking, OpenFoam is, is it is an open source tool from academic environment, but it's it's a very high impact on the market. If OpenFoam is used in Formula One, it's used also uh, at big aircraft companies in addition to uh, other commercial codes, and therefore uh, I would say it's a quite strong tool uh, with very good results. Next question is, uh, refining the mesh would lead to lowering the discretization error, but at the same time, higher linearization error can come, can come into account while solving the model. So how do you analyze the amount of mesh refinements required by certain regions of the model while controlling both errors and reaching appropriate solution? Also a good question. First of all, um, the mesh refinement is specified by the user. So we are only optimizing like in situations uh, where, for example, you have two refinements at the same point. Uh, uh, we are like the um, uh, parts between refinement zones are optimized automatically. But in the end, users control over the meshing. So um, this is um, on his side. Uh, um, uh, regarding... Um, the, the let's say balance between discretization error and linearization error. Um, if you have a very fine mesh um, uh, uh, and you are uh, afraid of a higher linearization error, what you can do, for example, is use another scheme like we do with bounded Gauss because bounded means that if uh, there is an obvious error, he is bounding the value. Or you can, for example, um, also uh, change the uh, relax relaxation to make sure that this, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, less errors, but then your solution takes more time. A site, I hope I pronounced the name right, has following question. Who, whose resources are being used for the computation? The host or SimScale server? Um, yes, we have, uh, we are right now using mainly Amazon as a provider of uh, cloud cloud resources, but you don't have to be afraid. So all your data is encrypted several times. It's even like that we, it's, as long as the project is not public, even uh, the only person who can encrypt this project is the, the user who created the project, the owner of the project. So uh, therefore we have a very high level of security and we are using, as I mentioned right now, mainly Amazon Elastic Cloud as a, a, a provider of, of cloud computing power. And um, there is a next question, which is uh, simply related to our cloud-based approach, uh, again by William. Uh, he said that uh, we can see some buffering and how complex could the model be? Can we make a whole plane made with the complex shapes in order to realize a wing shape study? Yes, William, uh, basically uh, we are no limitations. Uh, you can run up to like, I would say, 150 million cells for solving and post-processing. And uh, the reason for the buffering is that right now you can choose between local rendering and software rendering. And I use software rendering. Uh, 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 software rendering, which means the rendering is also done by a GPU instance of our, in our cloud. And this can uh, be the reason for this, this buffering. The good uh, news is that this buffering is like uh, for a long time independent from the mesh size. If you have a bigger model, uh, it will not become slower. And for sure, this is our post-processor is still a beta, so we are still improving it. Great, guys. So if there are no further questions, I would like to thank you again. And I would really like to see you next week. You can find the homework from now on the forum. And I will send you an email tomorrow uh, with all resources when everything uh, is prepared, including the recording. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Bye.